uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, what, a, what a great honor. And, and just having all my friends on board, uh, uh, Arvind, Shashank, Banshi, uh, Sanjay, Dr. Sadashiv Rao, just makes me very, very proud. I have no words to express this. Uh, Arvind may remember, this is probably the last big meeting that Dr. Adikot attended. Uh, and uh, interestingly, John Roche was honored on that. Uh, I've never had a meeting where uh, Dr. Sadikot has not complained about Arvind Sosali. Where is that madman is the first question I would get asked. But that is the epitome of a relationship, I think, for many, many years. That, that is a culmination that we see here. And I'm sure he wouldn't like the topic of my oration because he would think that I'm wasting my time on translational research. But having said that, it's beautiful to honor Dr. Sadikot, and, and the honor is mine. I, I've, I've had some great stuff, had great friends. The RSSDA honored me with the Sam G.P. Moses oration, which I think uh, was, was a feather in my cap. And now with the, the Sadikot oration on Diabetes India, I think, I think I can die peacefully. So let me talk about a uh, thing that, that is uh, part of what I do. I like, I like to take our ancient wisdom and see how it fits into science. So, ancient rhythms and a modern pandemic. Some of this is work I've done, some of this that I, is, is work I think needs to be done. So we'll talk about human evolution, we'll talk about sleep and light, a little about circadian and other rhythms. I'll talk about the mitochondrial piece, which is the emerging piece in this, and then just a bit about clinical correlates we have. We're gonna have a whole meeting full of that. Do you know who has the most fat in the world? My mother thinks I do, but uh, uh, the most fat in the world at birth is human being. And guess why? Because we also have the largest brains in the world. We have, we have for our evolutionary advantage, remember that there's only one more evolutionary, more specific, more, more conserved species and better species than us. That's something like us two cockroaches. They can survive a nuclear blast. But why have we survived? We gave up two things. We gave up two things. One is we gave up our, our beautiful four-leg walk, became erect. We gave up our reproductive advantage for reproductive efficiency. We don't have numbers, but we have strength of, of motherhood, nurturing, adolescence. So I still live with my mother and I'm 55. Right? So, so this is it. Now, the brain, like the fetus needs glucose. It loves glucose. It takes ketones, but it loves glucose. To make sure that the brain gives, gets glucose all the time, during times when food is not readily available, we started storing fat. And remember that when you didn't have glucose, it meant that you were also in trouble. Therefore, whenever fat was broken down, it was also a time of inflammation. So the breakage of fat and inflammation is something that happened evolutionarily. But, as I said, we are the only two species, the only species that does two things. We hunt and kill for pleasure and we eat for pleasure. There's no other species that does that. And because we started doing that, and indoor is my favorite place to do it, right? where else can you have uh, poha and jalebi in the morning? But every time you eat the jalebi, you're having inflammation. Why? Because your body is perceiving this as more food. And I have done this. This slide has been with me for the last 15 years. I've talked about this, how we've played with nature. More food, more frequent food, change in the quality of food, processed food. More light, less sleep, disturbed sleep, change in circadian rhythm, which I'll talk about today. Less physical work, more sedentary time, more screen time. And of course, stress and light. So what has really happened is something that is protective that every time that when fat was broken down, you had insulin resistance to protect the brain, became predatory and started developing into what we now know as diabetes. We know that the first thing that happens in the adipocyte is insulin resistance in the mTOR pathway, and then fat becomes systemic, and I've used this slide, and even in Indore many times before, this beautiful slide by Suganami that tells what happens when fat becomes ectopic, and fat gets uh, deposited in various places, the jugalbandi of fat and inflammatory markers leading ultimately to diabetes. And this is the first example, Mark Donath showing inflammation in the pancreas. And this particular 
think that the pancreatic beta cells lose their identity and become either alpha cells or non-insulin producing cells, lying in wait for a time that we reform, reduce your calories, lose your weight, become Roy Taylors, and become non-diabetic. But let me go on to the meat of what I want to talk about, and that's my, my own interest was, I love to sleep. And one, one of the first publications that we had 10 years ago was, was what happens to the A1C when sleep is disturbed. And that was the time when we also looked at rotating night shift and obesity, and we found out that nurses had a, had a greater amount of diabetes than anyone else, right? Now, uh, my, my, my research, unlike Dr. Chaudhary's, which is very focused, it's I, I'm a jack of many trades. So one of the parts that I did was animal work, and this was one of our first animal works. And what we did was, we took three, we, we, we couldn't do it to nurses, although we, we, we are we one of those few people who don't appreciate the value of nurses. We treat them like rats, but we are the ones. But, but when you put rats through a nurse's shift, giving them that, their glucoses go up, their triglycerides go up. But this is the most important part. I was actually doing this to see if FOXO is affected. But this is a normal circadian rhythm rat. Remember, rats are night feeders. This is a reverse this thing, and can you see what's happening to the pancreatic cells? It's almost like diabetes, that there's an expansion of uh, pancreatic cells. The pancreatic mass increases as an obesity. But when you do them an additional eight hours of light, put them through a nurse's shift, within three weeks, there is pancreatic desiccation, enzymatic degradation. Now, don't ask me what's happening in your nurses. It's probably happening to us because we are exposing ourselves to more light. It's not just to sleep. At the same time, there was this publication by Kian et al. that showed that when you reverse it, there is actually a reversal as well as a reduction in the production of insulin by the pancreatic beta cells. So clearly we know that light, circadian rhythm, altered sleep, all of these affect insulin pancreatic beta cells. And in fact, in a vulnerable person, the introduction of a LD to LL or increasing the light exposure actually can, can cause pancreatic. Now let me take you back and see how we can pull this in and, and let me propose some hypothesis. It's not that, that we had to invent this wheel. Long before the Indore Jugat, Sharaka talked about it. Nidhrayattam sukham dukkham pushtikarsham bhalabalam pushta klibata jnanam agyanam jivitam nacha. That is, Happiness, misery, nourishment, emaciation, strength, weakness, virility, sterility, knowledge, ignorance, life and death all depend on sleep. As, as anyone who is 50 plus knows that sleep is underestimated and sex is overestimated. So why is sleep necessary? Did you know that till 2014 we did not know why sleep was necessary? We had theories. But in 2014, please read this publication by Husserl et al. There was a, a postdoc uh, student in, in, in Boston who actually was able to make a rat sleep under a confocal microscope. And she showed that when you sleep, your brain shrinks to about a third of its size. These channels open up. And just like what happens in a hotel or, a, or an airport, the, the brain deep cleans itself. What happens after lunch? Uh, you close your door, you lie down, I do that all the time. I have a book in my hand, it falls on me. 20 minutes later, I'm up and I can see the next patient. If I don't do that, the next patient is going to get their brains chewed off. But, again, you know, this is the Taittiriya Upanishad Aruna Prashna. And beautiful, L listen to this. Sarvasvad bhuvanadi tasyaha paka visheshanaha murtam khala visheshanam. When I first read this, the Aruna Prashnam is, 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 the, is the thing that people do Surya Namaskara to. When I first read it, it said, it says that the course of time is understood by light and heat. I never understood that heat is also important. Apparently, heat is one of those sensations that resets circadian flow. Think about the ancient wisdom and war. So there are so many circadian rhythms that we have. And this is all that we know much about. But remember, there are circa lunar rhythms. For example, this is the ant lion. 
it's the one, the trap that it lays for its prey changes from full moon to new moon. Women, uh, many of them have lunar cycle. People who live in hostels, women who live in hostels, the menstrual cycle is cold, right? Our own time to sleep changes from, from Amavasya to Purnima. Then there are circadial rhythms. Uh, the, the ancients thought that the moon was responsible for growth of the plant. Circatidal actually. You have circa-annual rhythms. We have a circa-annual rhythms. In fact, very interestingly, bromocryptine, one of the drugs that was used for diabetes, dependent on a hibernation signal. And of course, we have ultradian rhythms that use the Fibonacci sequence. So we are matching to a divine mathematics. So there are biological rhythms. These have a genetic origin. They are controlled by biological clocks. These are calibrated to the, to, to the external light exposure. And there's a Zeitberger, but they can be calibrated instead by your food, by your activity, by the way you attack them. So these are the circadian rhythms. I won't go into it, but humans are done by circadian rhythms. If humans are maintained by circadian rhythms, then metabolism is also maintained by circadian In fact, the most conserved and ancient rhythm that we have is the sleep, eat, stop. When you are awake and you eat, you run. When you are asleep, you use a different fuel and you renew. Mitophagy, autophagy depends on the dark cycle. If you are a dark or a light person. And these are controlled by the molecular clock. I won't go into it. But this is clearly a well-established rhythm that has been present for centuries and centuries. And guess what we've done with it in the last hundred years? We've F-worded it, right? So there is, a, there is a suprachiasmatic nucleus, that is your clock setter. It has inputs, it has outputs, and each cell has its own clock that is set to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but it also resets its own behavior. And this is maintained by epigenetic. When we look for genetic answers, the answer is that this is by epigenetic imprinting. The clock influences the clock machine, it influences metabolism, it influences the cell cycle, and especially influences sleep. Therefore, our energy cycle is circadian. In the muscle, in the, in, in, in the liver, in, 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 in fat, and in every cell in the body. So the combination of, of the CRY and the PER gene can work on the clock, on gluconeogenesis, on adipocyte differentiation, and inflammation. And importantly, on energy, and I'll talk about it. So, remember, there are two different fuels that we have. One is glucose, the other is fat. Glucose is when you have access to food. Fat is when you don't have access to food. The exception is the heart. The heart depends on, on fat. It goes to glucose only if fat is not present or when ketones are present. That's the only other part. But what happens is there is a partitioning of fuel. So the electron cycle chain is the mitochondria, is where ATP is converted to ADP and back. And remember what Guyton said, what is life? Ultimately life is ATP to ADP and back and nothing else. Everything else that you're wearing today has nothing to do with only ATP to ADP. So when you do this, it's done in the electron chain and it's done in the mitochondria, right? And there are two different fuels. Depending on the fuel, the fuel influences its own metabolism. When glucose is present, it inhibits lipid metabolism. When fat is present, it, it, it inhibits glucose metabolism. When both are present, chaos happens. There is mitochondrial dysfunction. There's, there's, there is ROS production. There is as, uh, assembly problems. The cell becomes inefficient. In the heart, you get heart failure. In the pancreas, you get diabetes. Ultimately, these are all mitochondrial diseases which are occurring because you have not respected it. So we call these metabolic switches, that when glucose is present, fat is switched off. When fat is present, glucose is switched off. But this doesn't happen. You're eating all the time. At midnight, you come into your hotel. Yesterday, I ordered food. And this morning, I was wondering if I should order a jalebi extra. When this happens, exactly. So the mitochondria is controlled by the circadian rhythm. And this is the number of enzymes that are controlled by the, 
by, by the circadian. It's partitioned. I won't spend time on it. The respiratory chain is controlled by the circadian rhythm. And therefore, the metabolic flexibility to switch from fat to glucose, glucose to fat, determines diabetes. Just like Ken Polonsky first said, that the loss of rhythmicity is the first thing that is lost in diabetes, insulin, glucagon, rhythmicity. The metabolic inflexibility is the first abnormality that you will find in diabetes. Right? In the heart, it leads to heart failure. So what really happens is, there is a greater amount of respiratory chain uncoupling, which means a greater amount of fuel, different kinds of fuel reach the respiratory chain. There's a greater amount of UCP2 production greater amount of hydrogen ion leak and therefore mitochondrial dysfunction. But not enough to improve mitophagy or autophagy. There is a lesser amount of insulin produced in diabetes. In the pancreatic beta cell, it leads to beta cell dysfunction. With glucose lipotoxicity, two fuels are available all the time. The pancreas doesn't know how to deal with it. The muscle doesn't know how to deal with it. What do you get? Diabetes. So this is what happens. So the presence of metabolic flexibility and inflexibility is a feature of circadian dysrhythm. Let me take this back home. So what, what can we do about it? One, partition the fuels. Have a longer period of time eating. Second, eat less. You're not meant to be eating time. Every, every dietary intervention works by caloric restriction. Whether it is intermittent fasting, whether it is the ekadasis that I do, all of these work by caloric restriction. Eat half a stomach, right? Now, we have data in glue. So, there are three pathways that are working. One is the mTOR pathway, the sirtuin pathway, and the growth pathway. When you provide less fuel to these pathways, there is a slowing down, at least in yeast, in mice, and non-human primates. There's an improvement in life, longevity in humans, there is definitely an improvement in metabolic memory, in metabolic function, and possibly reversal of diabetes. So one, circadian desynchrony needs to be did. Try not. There was a time when Shashank and I used to do this three cities in a day, but we come a day before, have a good night's sleep, and then do our talks. Respect nature as much as you can. You don't need light all the time. Darkness is your friend. Second. We can think about timed interventions. We are talking about it. And there are some medications that are going to be available that will target molecular tox. Time-restricted eating. I believe that the studies are very, very poorly designed. So the data that is very mixed is not great. We'll wait for the data on that. The third thing is exercise. There's nothing like exercise that puts your clock back. Ketones are now available. Remember that uh, the Tour de France was won, won by the Oxford team drinking a ketone drink. Such a travesty has never happened, but it did. And those of you who, do, who, who have been dissing coconut oil for a long time, the C8 middle chain fatty acid that actually works as a fuel. Lastly, mitochondrial modulators are on the anvil. We have one drug now, but there are many, many that are, that are on the way. But what I really want to think to here to before I close is not everything old is bad. Not everything new is wonderful. The good person takes the good of the old and the good of the new by using his power of discrimination. I didn't say that. Kalidasa said it. And who better than Kalidasa to say such wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing? And who else than Dr. Shaukat Sadikot remember when we think about these wonderful things? Thank you so much. <laughs>